Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist Podcast, episode eight, season two. Today I'm speaking with Melissa Wesner. She is a licensed clinical professional counselor and licensed clinical mental health counselor and the founder of Life Spring Counseling Services, which is a group practice in Maryland. And uh, I've spoke with Melissa before. Um, back in 2021, episode 55 with Daniel Mayer, and we were talking about tips to protect your practice. Then uh, she and Dan are the hosts of the Protecting Your Practice podcast. If you have not checked that out, I highly recommend. Today, though, we're going to be talking about um, systems to consider when you're setting up a group practice. So if you're somebody who's had a solo practice, you're getting full and you're like, I can't take anybody else. Maybe I should consider expanding and growing. Well, this might be a good episode for you to listen to. Uh, Melissa has a thriving group practice and believe it or not, there was a time during COVID that she was living in another state managing her practice remotely, which that I was, that blew my mind. I was like, I don't know how, how you do that, but, um, she gives some really, really great tips and resources, um, to help people that are considering that. And of course, if you, um, if you want a free download, uh, which she is offering, which is how to start your group practice right from the start. You can get that by heading over to www.protectingyourpractice.com forward slash free dash downloads. The Creative Psychotherapist is the official podcast of the Creative Clinician's Corner, a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists. TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creative creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities, and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist Podcast. I'm your host, Raina Lombardi, and I'm really excited to welcome my next guest back to the show. Uh, she was on the show a while back. Her name is Melissa Wesner. And she is a licensed clinical professional counselor. Mm -hmm. All the acronyms change and depending on the state. So I'm never quite sure. Um, and she's the founder of Life Spring Counseling Services, a Maryland based group practice where she and her therapist strive to provide hope, healing, and empowerment through the collaborative process of counseling. As a certified brain spotter and brain spotting consultant, she is an avid believer in the power of brain spotting. She's a dreamer, a doer, and a co host on the Protecting Your Practice podcast, which, if you haven't listened to yet, I highly, highly recommend. Thank you so much for being here, Melissa. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about. Me too. So, one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you today is I wanted to spend more time this season talking with people about group practices and how group practices are different than solo practices and how their needs differ. And I'm wondering, maybe we could just start of like, how did you end up running a group practice? How did that happen? Yes. Well, having a private practice was never on my radar and having a group practice was also never on my radar. So I had no idea what I wanted to do when I got done grad school. Um, but there was a point in time where I realized that I needed to be, I was teaching at a university and I realized that I needed to be back doing clinical work. 
And then once I had my private practice, I realized that my caseload was full. People were still calling me. I'm still responding to them. And I needed to give them referrals somewhere. But at the time, I didn't know anybody in the area. I didn't know any of the providers. So I found myself going online and searching for people who I could refer them to. But I didn't know who any of those people were. So I felt kind of bad. Like, here's the name of a random person that I found online. I hope you like them. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really feel good about that. And so it was at that point that I knew that I might need to look into going into a group practice because then I could hire people that I knew liked and trusted. And so when people called me, even if they couldn't work with me, I could refer them to somebody that I have already spoken with that I knew. So I knew that that client would be in good hands. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. And I feel like that is a similar, um, kind of path that I had taken as well. Like, yeah. oh gosh, like I can't, I, I need to say no. And I need mm -hmm. other people to send these folks to, um, or it was like people that I knew that were asking and I'm like, well, I can't work with them. I need, I need good people to refer them to. Yeah. And it takes a while to build those community relationships. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to somebody who's thinking about opening a group practice, what are some like foundational, um, ideas and, uh, kind of protocols that they need to be thinking about even before they start to bring on a team so that the practice can be, uh, you know, successful can flow easily. Yeah. So I think the first, the very first thing that people need to think about is what model do I want to use? Do I want to have independent contractors at my office? Do I want to have employees? And definitely doing a lot of research to make sure that you understand that. Cause I think a lot of times people don't know the difference. You're, you know, you're doing this for the first time and you might end up doing what other people that you know are doing. Well, my friends are doing this. They have contractors or they have employees or a lot of people are doing this, or I worked somewhere under this model and you kind of replicate maybe without doing the research to really understand the difference between those models. So I think it's important to really think about which model you want to offer at your office and to make sure that you are informed about the differences. And then depending on what you decide, that's going to influence some of your next steps. If you are going to hire contractors, making sure that you're treating them like contractors, you're going to need a contract that hopefully you have an attorney either create or review for you. Um, if you have employees, you're going to figure out what paperwork do I need, my handbook, my operations manual. There's a lot of paperwork that has to get done. And you have to pay people. So you have to think about how am I going to pay these people? What system will we use for um, payment? Um, and also you have to think about what will my onboarding process be when I have people? Um, so those are a lot of the logistics that are super duper important and they can be a little bit time consuming, but I think that it's worth taking the time, even if it feels like it's slowing you down a little bit, coming up with a really good solid foundation will save you some stress headaches later on. Um, yeah, for sure. You don't want to have to go back and like re redo things because you set it up in a way that really wasn't maybe legally appropriate or just isn't functioning. Yeah. And I think before you even start interviewing, you really have to have a little check-in with yourself to say, what am I looking for? What am I looking for in the people who will join my office? Um, what are, you know, what do I value in my office? What are those characteristics that I would like in someone who's going to join us? And really reflecting on that so that you can communicate that and make that clear as you begin advertising for those positions. Mm. I, I think that brings up this idea of like having a strong vision. Mm-hmm. Right. And like, what do you want your culture to be like within your practice? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. And some people are really good at that, at building culture and community. And for other people, they find that sometimes the culture that comes about maybe because of people that they've brought on board isn't exactly what they were looking for. Right. And then we have to shift some things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when, when you are bringing on people and you're bringing on therapists into the practice, do you have uh, like a system and like a process of how you go about doing that? Yes. And this has changed over time. When I first started, we had contractors at our office. So that was the model that we used. And also when you start interviewing people, I mean, you do the normal stuff, like you look up some common interview questions and you think about the interview questions that are important for you. But in the beginning, it is a little bit weird. Like, oh my gosh, do I know what I'm doing? Like, who are, who am I to be interviewing people to work at my office? Isn't that weird? Like, are they going to know that this is the first time I'm ever doing this? Like, are they going to know? <laughs> um, so, and I've learned a few things over time. You know, I think going through the interview process originally has really shown me what I value, what I want for my office and the people who work at my office and what I do not want. Um, But we now have employees at our office. One of the things that I think is really helpful for us is our webpage. Our Mm -hmm. website, I think, does a really good job of communicating what we value as an organization, hope, healing, empowerment. But we also talk about what we want for our counselors. And we're really clear to communicate that we want people who really love what they do as a counselor. We want people who really care about their clients And that might sound like, well, yeah, don't most mental health providers, but like not everybody who's licensed really loves therapy. They don't necessarily really love the work. Um, When I started out interviewing contractors, a lot of people were like, well, I'm just looking for flexibility. When I would ask about why they were interested in this position and that's great. And I really want people who love what they do. I want people who love working with clients. I want people who um, care about the work. And so I think we try to be really clear about communicating that on our website to make sure that that resonates with the people that we're looking for. Mm, No, that that's very helpful. I find that when people have done their own research too, of like, Mm -hmm. They've checked you out. They know a little bit about your work. They've been on your website. They have questions about, you know, what you're doing, that that really kind of shows too that they're committed to this process um, as well. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So like when people have done their research, it shows in the interview and they're, Mm -hmm. they're able to bring that about. And that kind of, that feels like a stronger candidate. Yes. And I, in my, when someone reaches out, there's two things that I do personally. I say in my email to them and please review the website, this particular page before you come, because I want to make sure that they have reviewed it so that they understand what they're looking for. So if that doesn't resonate with them, that they know before we even meet the other thing that, you know, we're all particular about our own things, right? And there are some things that I'm particular about. I include in my job description that we require a cover letter and resume. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we do that because I am very big on whether or not one people actually want the position enough to write a cover letter and also whether or not people follow directions. So (laughs) because I want people who will, you know, our podcast is about crossing your T's and dotting your I's. I want people who, you know, who follow directions, who read directions, who are going to be diligent about um, like charting the way that we might need to chart for compliance. And so one of the things that I look for is did someone read the directions in my, in my post or on our website about what they need to do in order to be considered for the position? Mm. Have you ever had somebody contact you because they weren't considered because of that? Nope. I don't tell them that that's why I didn't look at their, um, their application. So they don't know, (laughs) but 
I pay attention and typically I do not follow up with um, an invitation interview. Mm, okay. Excellent. And lots of people have feelings about that. Some people are like, oh, they're a waste of time. Um, you know, and that's where as a group practice owner, you have the ability to say what is important to me, what is important to my practice. Some people are anti cover letter. And if that's you, that's okay. Some people do video interviews, you know, so whatever is going to work best for you and your office and, and what you're trying to, to grow. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like the intentionality and the purpose behind it. It's, um, just a small way of assessing somebody's professionalism and real level of commitment, right? If it's just like, Oh, maybe I'll do this. We might not be paying as much attention to the details, but if it's like, oh my gosh, I really, really want to do this. I'm going to make sure that I've read it several times. I'm going to make sure that I've checked that I did everything and, you know, really follow through and do the due diligence. Yeah. And I once heard, um, someone who does HR talk about comparing hiring and dating, right? Like if you're dating someone, you go out on several dates. Like you might know after the first date, this person is not for me, right? So that could happen. But then you, you know, you continue meeting with someone, you get to know them over a period of time. There's these different steps you go through. Maybe you make your relationship official um, in some way as dating later on. Maybe there's an engagement or marriage. Um, and they were talking about with hiring, you have like one or two meetings with someone and then you make this big commitment yeah. And you only have an hour or two plus whatever references you're doing or background check. You have this very limited amount of time to make an assessment about whether or not you and this other person are going to commit to one another. Gotcha. And that can be kind of scary. Yeah, because you want to make a good decision and, and, you know, maybe sometimes it doesn't always work out. You have a very brief period of time to make a decision. Mm -hmm. This episode of The Creative Psychotherapist is brought to you by Florida Art Therapy Services. Florida Art Therapy Services is a proud provider of continuing education sponsored through the Florida Board of Clinical Social Work, Marriage and Family Therapy and Mental Health Counseling, and offers a wide variety of continuing education trainings on the topics of supervision, art therapy, and other requirements for Florida licensure. We are excited to be welcoming special guest uh, trainers, art therapists, Carol Cox and Amy Bucciarelli, who will be teaching a Mastering the Meaning of Mandalas training. It's a three-day intensive training, which will allow participants to earn 20 hours worth of CEUs. And that's going to be taking place April 28th through 30th, 2023 at our Fort Myers office. Over the course of the three days, people will be exploring mandala making as a way to find identity and meaning through the lens of the life cycle. It's taught in a unique format, which incorporates lectures, meditation, music, and lots of artistic creation of mandalas as well. I took this training in 2019, and I was blown away by the content, and it's altered my work uh, since having taken the training and I'm excited to take it again. And I really encourage you all to check it out. If you have any interest in deepening your understanding of the mandala and um, helping to use it as a, uh, a source of greater understanding with your clients, I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Amy and Carol do a phenomenal job. And you can learn more about that training and all the other trainings that we provide at Florida Art Therapy Services on our website, www.floridaarttherapyservices.com. Just click on the continuing education menu and you'll get a drop down and you can click on mastering the meaning of mandalas or one of the other trainings as well. Do you, now that you 
obviously in the beginning, you didn't have other <laughs> people to like interview potential um, additions to the team with you. But now that you do have a team, do you include them in the interviewing process to see kind of how people connect and relate? Um, I haven't, we haven't been doing that as part of a system, but I have been doing it. Um, most recently we have brought on a clinical supervisor who has been absolutely wonderful to have on board. Mm. And, you know, for example, I, there have been times where I'm like, I like someone else to meet with this person to get a decision. And so we schedule a second interview, um, or maybe we're considering them for a position that wasn't originally on the table. So I might want, you know, our clinical supervisor to meet with them to also assess. Um, I went away recently for a retreat and someone wanted to interview and I didn't want to delay. So I asked them if they could do that for me. And that was really nice to know that I can go and do my things and someone else can take care of it, that it doesn't always have to be me. I also have our clinical supervisor do the references for me. So if I'm the one who did the interview, they have the opportunity to be doing the references to be a second person who's getting that information. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. So what do you think helps in terms of keeping a team? You know, mm -hmm. you've gone through this process to really select, be intentional mm -hmm. in your selection of bringing on therapists that you feel are going to be a good fit with your group, your values. Then once they're there, what are things that practice owners need to be thinking about in terms of morale mm -hmm. and, and retention? Cause it does cost a lot of money, regardless of whether it's a contractor or an employee Mm -hmm. to bring somebody on. Yes. Yeah. So office culture is something that I love. Like I love hosting things. I love planning things. Culture, office culture is really important to me. And I feel like I had a really good model for that when I was working at community mental health agency where, you know, they had a really good office culture. Some parts of it maybe needed tweaking, but in general, um, I really enjoyed the culture. And so I think that that was helpful in uh, establishing some of the positive things that I would want at our own office. So some things that we do at our office to facilitate um, culture and just supporting our staff, we do offer benefits. We offer a lot of benefits. Uh, we might offer, I mean, it depends. There's, you know, when you talk to different group practice owners, there's kind of a spectrum of benefits that people offer or don't offer. We offer a lot of benefits. Um, so that's one of the things that we do to make sure that people are feeling cared for. We offer supervision for provisionally licensed therapists. We have a monthly peer consultation meeting for anyone at our office who wants to participate. We've had some people who were at our office and they've left to go and do their own practices and who are like, can I stay? You know, so they're still a part of our community in some way. Um, so we also have like a Google chat. We use Google for our email. So we have a Google chat that we use together. We have someone who does a question of the week. So that way, um, we're just getting to know one another. We all work remotely. So we have a fun question of the week so we can talk about something fun and get to know one another together. We try to do quarterly gatherings. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that we did at the start of last year uh, cause we also have a monthly meeting that we call the coffee corner. We voted on our name. So we have coffee corner meetings on a monthly basis and each therapist and staff member doesn't, you don't have to be a therapist is responsible for opening up our meeting in some way with some kind of a ritual. It could be a reflection exercise, a guided imagery, an icebreaker, but they are responsible for opening up our meeting. Uh, and that's another good way for us to get to know one another, see one another's skill sets. Um, at the start of last year, we talked about rituals that we wanted to develop at our office. And so we brainstormed what those might be. And then this past year, we implemented them. We now have a collect, like a collective birthday party celebration in the summer. We have a potluck oh. in November, our holiday gathering, which we had been doing before. And we do like a little white elephant. Um, so we try to do little gatherings together. Um, we also, um, in terms of systems and things like that, we have an internal website that we use that has a page where 
people can learn some fun facts about one another that we don't post publicly, but just some fun facts uh, so we can get to know one another. Nice. It sounds like you have invested a lot in making sure that there's opportunities for connection. Um, even though it, sometimes I think there's this idea that, oh, it's a group practice. Like you're going to be in community with one another all the time, but most often, even if you're there at the same time, Mm -hmm. you're in with clients. And so you're not necessarily, there's not really moments to connect with one another or they're like fleeting, you know, and if you're working remotely, Mm -hmm. then there's even less opportunities to meet, but it sounds like you're very intentional on creating, um, moments either online or in person to connect throughout the year. Yeah. And, and like you said, even when we were in person, sometimes we wouldn't see one another until like the very end of the day, when we were done seeing clients, that would be the only time that we might see one another. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so that goes into maintaining your clients and the morale Have you ever had a situation where there was somebody in that you brought in that just did not connect and did not have high morale, despite, you know, really trying to set up a a supportive and caring place for them to thrive? And how did you handle that? Yeah. Well, I think a few things. I think sometimes, at least in my experience, the one way where I see people get weeded out, so to speak, sometimes is even before they come on board, our practice takes insurance. And so it is 120 days often to get credentialed with insurance companies, which is a giant pain in the butt. Um, But sometimes if there's something wishy-washy or something that just doesn't feel right, sometimes it's during that initial startup phase that uh, we might end up not moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and we try to be open. So at our office, one of maybe two years ago, we had a conversation about how we will approach conversations with one another. And we have made some community agreements about what that will look like, understanding that it's not about if someone says or does something to rub us the wrong way, that it's a matter of when that it will happen. And So we've made some agreements about how we will approach conversations when we need um, or how we will receive if someone else comes to us. And so we've posted those also on our internal website and also understanding we want community um, at our office. And we also want to be able to have hard conversations if we need to. And people at our office knows that that includes me. If there's something that I have done or said that's not okay, Um, And I let people know that we want this to be a place where they can ask their questions. And so if staff members are like, hey, this is going on and I'm feeling this way about it, it could be with me or even somebody else, a dynamic at the office, they know that they can come to me and say what's going on, how they're feeling about it. They know that I will follow up in the way that I need to follow up. Um, So we haven't had to have too many of those conversations, but we do try to make sure that if, uh, if anyone at our office is communicating a concern about energy dynamic communication, that we are addressing it quickly and communicating the expectation. Mm, yeah. I, I like that addressing it quickly. I think that that's so important. Um, if somebody comes and they're frustrated about a situation and they tell us, and we don't, do anything about it and it takes a long time to do something about it, then it can feel like, oh, they didn't really listen. Yeah. And, you know, I think obviously a lot of people, especially right now, are wanting to hire new staff, hire therapists. You're wanting to retain staff. You hope that they'll be happy at the office. And also there's this other reality that sometimes you need to prune, Mm. right? Just like with plants or bushes, like sometimes you need to prune that that plant in order for it to be healthy. And I think sometimes there's a pruning process that needs to happen at your office as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And to know that that is, that that is okay to do some pruning 
if that's going to be for the betterment of your office, whether that's for the culture um, or other things maybe that aren't working right now. Um, and I'm reading this book, Good to Great. I think it was chapter mm. three. It was a really great, I just finished reading it the other day. It was a really good chapter talking about what you had just mentioned about when, when there is a problem at work or a problem with somebody that other people can see, whether it's a dynamic or someone not pulling their own weight or whatever, or maybe interrupting someone else's process if they're relying on someone for something and it's repeatedly not happening. And they were talking about the impact on your entire team of you not taking action. If everybody can see that there's this dynamic or this issue happening and you as the leader are not addressing it, what message does that send? Uh, and maybe people's tendency to be like, well, you know, it'd be so hard to have that conversation or so hard to find somebody else. Um, and so I would say for anyone who's in that place, that would be a very good chapter to read. Oh, thank you for sharing that resource. I'll look it up and put it in the show notes for people for sure. Awesome. Um, I, I think that that is a really important part. Like I, I don't think anybody says, oh, I'm going to start a business and, um, and I'm going to, you know, let people go. Right. But there might come a time where that has to happen in order for the whole business itself to be healthy and successful and grow. Um, but I imagine there are some things that we need to be considering in how we do that. Do you have any recommendations for, for that? Like, obviously I would imagine it's going to be different in everybody's state based on labor laws and things like that. But mm -hmm. like, what, how would people know if they've never been in that position before? About doing things in a way that's compliant. Yeah. About, about how do you go about letting somebody mm. go yeah. and is there resources out there so that people can organize themselves in their system around that when that time comes? Yeah. And this is one of the things that I think can be really challenging. Any conversation about letting someone go is a hard conversation. It's never a conversation that you want to have the person who's going to be on the receiving end of the conversation. It's going to be a hard conversation, you know, for them as well. And I think that this is one I think that this is part of the the hard part of being a group practice owner. There's all these other outside resources that you need to support you. And so I think one of those people might be, do I have an HR consultant? Whether that is someone who's in-house, who works at my office and is trained in HR, like larger group practices might have that. Or if you're contracting with an HR company, so we have worked with an HR company for our office to develop our initial compensation model. Um, and to do our like annual performance review forms. Um, so I think if you have an HR consultant that you work with, that can be really helpful to guide you. Um, and also if you have an attorney that you have access to just to make sure um, that you're consulting with them. Um, if you do have employees, you might have a performance improvement plan in place that you would implement. Um, you likely, if you have employees, you might have an annual review process. Our review process is like a three-part review that we do throughout the year. Um, so those are some measures in place um, to help give people feedback um, and also set goals. Um, so having your team in place, I would say, and also having those internal processes, mm -hmm. which take some time to develop. Yeah, I I have not encountered, you know, that, at this juncture. Um, and I, I hope that I don't, <laughs> but it makes me think about the legal consequences that could potentially happen and that people have due process rights. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that if we do have, some, if we're employing somebody and it's our first time being an employer, we're not necessarily going to know all the mm -hmm. ins and outs of both state and federal codes. Yeah. 
that apply to that. And you don't want to just be like, well, I'm going to let you go. And you didn't go through all of these things you were supposed Mm -hmm. to do. And then they come back at you. Um, So I like that idea of working with an HR consulting company that is going to really specialize in that back end suite of things um, from start to finish, right? Yeah. And knowing that how you approach it will be different depending on whether that person is an employee or a contractor. Mm -hmm. With a contractor, you're going to want to go back to the contract and remember that this is why we have contracts in place, right? And to be able to read whatever your contract says about how you will handle it and how the other person will handle things if either one of you need to end that contract and making sure that you're following that process that was outlined at the onset of that agreement. Mm, Very important. Yeah. And if you're writing a contract, making sure that you're getting it reviewed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Um, So I feel like the we've talked a lot about kind of back end stuff. Mm -hmm. What about front end stuff? Because I feel like if you don't have a good front end system, then that's going to impact, you know, are people getting their ideal clients? Are they getting Mm -hmm. clients that they like to work with? Or is it like a replication of, um, like a community model where it's like, we'll take anybody who calls and you get who you're assigned, which that doesn't often feel very good. And that makes it difficult, um, for the therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that this is where that group practice owner, their style and approach and what they value that this is going to show up here. Um, Because there certainly are community mental health agencies where it's like, we want you to see anybody and everybody. It could be a five-year-old. It could be a 65-year-old. It could be this diagnosis or that one or that one. And it doesn't matter. They're going on your caseload. Uh, Whether or not that's your skill set or not, that's what's happening. Um, The approach that we take at my office is, and again, we we have employees. Everybody at our office has a profile on our website. So clients can read about each of our therapists uh, and we really encourage our therapists to put some thought into it to make sure that they show up and come across on their profile page. And sometimes we have to modify it. Sometimes someone starts out saying, I think that this is who I want to work with. And then after a while, they're like, I think that maybe I need to change that. Um, and at so at our office, we operate from a place of we don't just accept any client. We want to make sure that they're a right fit. We want to make sure that they're in the right level of care. If someone is calling and it sounds like they need a detox, they won't be a good fit for our office, right? Um, For a while, we didn't work with children. So if, but we would still get phone calls for couples or for children. So we have an administrative assistant who answers all of our calls Monday through Friday, nine to five. And she knows um, everybody's specialties. And so she is the one who will do a lot of the screening to make sure that clients are matched with the right provider. And if they ask for that provider and they're available, we'll make sure that we can connect that way. Um, But I think also that having like support for your therapist includes having administrative support. Like at our office, we have a billing team that we use. So our therapists don't have to be involved with um, the billing process verification. We have someone who is on our phones all the time. So our cl- our clinicians don't have to be answering the phones. Um, and I think that that's really good for community. One of the things that we hear at my office all the time is, oh my gosh, thank you so much for answering the phone. Thank you for calling me back. Because a lot of maybe smaller practices don't have someone on the phone. You're in sessions, you can't answer the phone. And so I find that both for our therapist and for the community, um, it's really helpful because by the time someone decides that they want therapy, like you want to, you want to strike while the iron's hot, keep the momentum going. And, um, I think having someone on the phones helps keep that process going rather than feeling like it's an obstacle in their way. Yeah, no, I think that's, that is a huge 
huge problem no matter where you are located. And and I hear that too sometimes, or even with emails. Mm-hmm. And, and I struggle sometimes getting back with emails because I get so many emails every day that sometimes there's one or two that I miss, or I think Mm -hmm. I sent it and it's in drafts, you know? Um, you know, so I, I know that it's, it's not always easy, but Mm -hmm. it does make a huge impact when people get a call or response back in a quick turnaround of time. That was one of the first things that I like the first add-ons that I did um, yeah. was having a virtual assistant to answer the phones. Yeah. It makes such a big difference. I think sometimes we wait, I know that I waited a while to make that decision. Um, but it is so helpful to have that extra person available to answer those calls and to return them. Um, so if anyone is listening and has been thinking about, should I do that? Should I not do it? Just know that it will be a huge relief. Oh yeah. Huge relief like stress relief. Mm -hmm. And, um, and honestly, you, I think some people will worry of like paying somebody to do it. Yeah. But it's totally worth it. It's Mm -hmm. totally worth it for the conversion. Yes. And I was in a, a training, I think a few years ago, maybe three years ago, and they were talking about this very thing. And they were saying, But think about if you have someone who's on the phone who can schedule an appointment right now, right away when you're busy because you're in appointments versus the reality that you might have just missed out on having someone on your calendar or on your therapist's calendar because you didn't answer the phone, right? And so even knowing that that position is not necessarily a direct revenue generating position, but it is a position that can help bring revenue into your practice just by answering the phone. Yeah. Yes. Which makes it pay for itself, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> makes yes. a posi- position pay for itself. And I I think there's a lot of fear, I think sometimes of like spending money. And, I, and I've mm-hmm. heard of other group practice owners. I've known of other group practice owners that they don't farm that out. They, mm-hmm. they rely on themselves or um, themselves and the team of people within the office to be the people answering the phones and returning the phone calls. Yeah. Yeah. And I can certainly speak to that from my own experience. So, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about, you know, their own money stuff as therapists or business owners, a family I grew up in, they were, I don't want to say thrifty, cheap, We were a cheap family. Getting a bargain was like a good thing. Like you want to get a bargain and you want to save money. And, you know, you don't necessarily want the brand name item because you can get the generic cheaper. You know, we like loved yard sales in my family. So that was my (laughs) background of like cheap and not spending money was a good thing. And so when I started my private practice, I thought, okay, well, the goal is make money, don't spend money. And then, so it was at the end of my first full year in private practice, I did that. I made money and I didn't spend money. Like I was real cheap, not spending money unnecessarily. And I did exactly what my accountant told me to do that year. I sent in my quarterly taxes. I sat down with her and I was so proud to show her that I sent everything in on time in the amount that she told me. I was so proud and I was so happy because it was the most money that I had ever made in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I was feeling so good and I couldn't believe it. And then she was like, so did you save, did you save like money aside? Did you put money aside for taxes? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I sent in the money that you told me to send. And she's like, well, you're going to owe about $10,000. Oh, the worst. Yes. And so I left that meeting so mad. I was like fuming um, because no, I didn't put that money aside. I sent in the money when you told me to send it. Wasn't that what I was supposed to do? But during that conversation, what she did say to me was, well, you're making money and you don't have a lot of expenses. 
She's like, so you, if you want to pay less in taxes, she's like, you can work less Mm -hmm. or you can spend some money. Like if you have some trainings that you would like to go to, or if you have these other things that you might like to do for your office. And so that very next year, I was like, all right, like, I guess I'm going to have to learn how to spend money. Mm -hmm. And so I did. That was the year I started investing in more specialized trainings for myself clinically. There was a specialized training I wanted to go to. I signed up for it. Um, So learning how to spend money and being okay with money and, you know, the right balance of spending, not like overdoing it. Um, but can be a challenge, especially, mm-hmm. you know, if you come from a background like mine, where spending money is, you know, not what you want to do. You want to get a bargain. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that, that, that's, um, that is one of the challenges, right. Of, for many of us coming in of like, oh, I'm not really sure how all this works. And we come with our own money stories and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I've heard somebody say, well, I either I either spend money on, you know, making my office look amazing or I or I give that money to the IRS. I don't know about you, but I'd rather make my office look amazing. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, because it's not like you're not paying any taxes. You're still mm-hmm. paying plenty yeah. of taxes. Um, it's just you you're able when you balance it out of like, these are the expenses to keep the business and to keep it nice. Cause that is important too. having mm-hmm. a nice looking office, having those trainings, being on the top of your game, that stuff is important too. Um, it helps balance it out. Yeah. Yeah. Which was certainly something I thought about after that conversation. I mean, and it can be small ways too we had a, like a grocery store next to my old in-person office. And my thought was, you know what, if I want some fresh flowers for our office, I'm going to go over and spend the 10 bucks on our flowers, you know, that I'll be able to enjoy that our clients will be able to enjoy. And so learning also how to spend in a way that you can benefit from professionally with training. And that's going to be, that is going to make it a nice place for you, your therapist and your clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that means, you know, hiring administrative employees to help you with things that might mean hiring cleaners for your office, Mm -hmm. which it took me a long time to be willing to spend on that. Let me tell you, yes, I, I did spend at first and that was short lived. And then I didn't until this past year, I hired a professional cleaning company that like does the cleaning and sanitizing and all of that stuff. And I'm like, you know what, this is totally worth the $250 a month um, that I spend on that so that I'm not going in every weekend cleaning the office for several hours, which is what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think two things. I think one, those are the behind the scenes things that business owners do that nobody else knows about, right? Everyone else is like, oh, Raina, that's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. You have your group practice. They don't see me scrubbing the toilets. (laughs) Right. You know, it's like, I'm working really hard. You're not seeing this, you know, you're not seeing this part of the reality. Um, So that's definitely one thing that I'm thinking about. And also thinking about what is the value of your time? If you weren't cleaning your office, if you weren't answering the phones, you know, Mm -hmm. potentially you would either be, I don't know, relaxing, which might be nice, spending quality time with your family, or maybe you would be seeing clients, right? So is it better for you to be on the phones or doing these other tasks that don't necessarily generate revenue or for you to be generating revenue while you can pay someone else to do that thing? Um, And also, so you're working within your skill set right? Within your skill set and your interest. Right. The zone of genius idea of like, if it's Mm -hmm. not my zone of genius, then I don't do it. I hire somebody else to do it. And I think as like, as the group practice owner, when we take on that mindset, right? Like every hour that we farm out to somebody else to be doing these things that we're doing, Mm -hmm. that opens us up to be able to work more on the business versus in the business, Mm -hmm. which can help us clean up systems that are wonky, which can help us 
create these opportunities for connection with our teams, which there's so many other ways that that time is better spent and more fulfilling. Yeah. And I think knowing that wherever you are in your group practice, that that will always, there will always be that challenge, right? When you're starting out, maybe it's hiring the admin or um, maybe that's like your first thing that feels like a big thing. But then as you grow and your practice becomes bigger, now you're like, now I need these other people and you're constantly hiring these other people to support your practice who aren't revenue generating people, but we're going to make sure that they're doing maybe what you don't do as well. And even now, like there are some people who I need on my team who are not currently on my team. And I'm like, wow, that's gonna cost some money. And how do I make sure that I can do that? So I can stop doing some of these tasks that I really don't love. So you have, a, you know, your clinical um, manager, you have mm -hmm. your receptionist, you have a biller. What else do you have? What other yeah. kinds of positions do you have as yeah. your administrative <laughs> behind the scenes? Yeah. So we have um, a billing team. That's not an in-house one. We contract with them. We have a full-time person who does our social media, our website updates, our SEO, our newsletter. And so we also have someone who does that full-time social media is not my love. And so she handles that. Um, and that way our therapists aren't having to do anything to advertise their services. So we have someone full-time who does that. We have our bookkeeper, we have our attorney. Um, I feel like I'm missing someone. We're looking at getting a CFO this year. Um, wow. And on my, yeah. So, um, we have a good number of people that we are working with either in-house now or that we work with outside of the office. And of course, like an accountant, you know, and I have my financial advisor. So there's a bunch of people who are on, who are on the team. Wow. That's pretty amazing. And how many therapists work in your group, Melissa? Yeah. Currently we have 14 people on board, um, and we are hiring. So we are looking for some new therapists to join our office. Oh, wonderful. Um, I, it's interesting. You have 14 therapists. Well, 14 total of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not all therapists, 14. That's our whole team. That's the whole team. So like, that's the whole team. Even with your, your clinical manager, the marketing person, right that all adds up to 14 people, including mm -hmm. the therapists. I, that's really inspirational, um, to know that, okay, even if it is a small team, it's mm -hmm. still possible to bring on these additional support staff, mm -hmm. um, that are not non-revenue generating, I think was the term. Yeah. That used. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Is there any other advice that you have to therapists that are um, thinking about opening a group practice, or maybe they have started mm -hmm. a group practice, but they feel like they're kind of treading water and kind of stumbling around? Yeah. I think before you open a group practice, really check in with yourself and ask your, check in on your why. What is the reason that I want to have a group practice? I know when I, you know, you heard my reason for opening a group practice because of referrals. And I wanted to make sure that people were legitimately taken care of and in good hands when they called our office, instead of just referring them out to somebody I didn't know. Um, but I think that there were a lot of things that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, the people who I would see advertising consultation for private practice or group practice work is like, you can do it. And it's so great. And all these great things. Um, and, and also I think that sometimes in the community, there's a perception that group practice owners are just like rolling in the dough, right? Like they're having a grand time. They have therapists working at their office and they're doing who knows what, right? And people are making money for them. And so I think sometimes there's that idea that exists. 
when the reality is it is not an easy job. No. And managing people is not an easy job. Being the person who's responsible for the office, the liability, the systems, the paperwork, the training, the onboarding, the hiring, making sure that things don't fall apart. Um, it's a lot of stress and responsibility sometimes. And so I think it's really important for anyone who is seeing people advertise about all of the wonderful, glorious aspects of it. It can be good, right? Um, and to go in understanding that it's going to be both. It's going to be good and rewarding and it's going to be hard. So mm -hmm. knowing why am I doing this? What is my why? Because you're going to need that when it gets hard. When it gets hard, you're going to need to remember why you started down this road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's so true. It It is fraught with a variety of additional challenges um, that you think like, oh, I already have the individual thing going. <laughs> How hard could it be? It should be, be? easy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to just replicate what I'm doing, but some things can't be replicated for the group mm -hmm. um, to have it flow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole other learning curve. Yeah. Is there any one resource that has been helpful for you in creating the systems in your group practice that have really helped things flow and become efficient and effective for you and your team? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I mean, having, having an attorney is helpful in drafting documents that is really helpful to make sure, you know, and consultants, having consultants to make sure that you're doing things the right way. That has been really helpful. And we have an intrasite. So this internal website that we use, which I think has been really helpful for us internally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a calendar on there. We have a referral list of other community providers that we can refer to if we need. We have training videos on there. We have other important documents that we can store in there in a centralized location. I think that's one thing that we didn't have from the get-go, but mm -hmm. that has really developed over time and just been helpful. So we don't have things in random folders. We have to remember where they are. Everything is in one central location. Yeah. I like that intrasite too, better than drive. Like I have the mm -hmm. Google workspace, I have the drive and I have all the folders, but there's something visual. There's a visual ease on the intrasite in terms mm -hmm. of how the information is organized that yes. I don't get in the drive section. Yes. And I love, you know, I love having Google docs. I love Google forms and all of that. But for the life of me, I still to this day don't even know how to create a folder in there. So um, that says a little bit about my skill set. Um, so for me, an intrasite was much easier. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you talking with me today and sharing all your wisdom with listeners. I hope that uh, they find a lot of value and ideas and things for them to think about if they are planning to go into having their own group. And um, where can people find more information about you and um, what you do? Yes. So you can get information about me at my counseling practice, lifespringcounseling.net. And also if you go to the protecting your, protecting your practice podcast, you can take a listen to some of our episodes there. If you're looking to cross your T's and dot your I's. I highly recommend people listen to the podcast with Melissa and Dan. Um, they give lots of really valuable, um, business level advice and, um, and then talk about some other challenging topics related to running a private practice. Um, so that's protecting your practice.com. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Raina, for having me. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.